This one's for Andrew. Adventures in Music. <clears throat> War Child, Jethro Tull. I bought this record in junior high, maybe seventh grade. I got it at J.P. Snodgrass. <laughs> On Sundays, they advertised their sales in the paper. Albums were $3.99 and $4.99. I could walk there. It was about a mile away, across from Value City. J.P. Snodgrass sold jeans and records. Their logo was a balding, bearded, Victorian or gay 90s looking man <laughs> in profile with a curling pipe. The kind of image which, even apart from the pipe, appealed to stoners at that time. <laughs> it was the equivalent to the appeal of a top hat in a rock and roll setting. There was something defiant in it, something co-optive about claiming a top hat out of its customary context, whatever that was. At one point or another, I bought or considered buying records by acts as diverse as T-Rex, Leon Russell, Leonard Skinner, Roy Wood, and Alice Cooper because they all had featured top hats. <laughs> <laughs> J.P. Snodgrass had shallow bins of albums along one wall with new releases displayed above. The rest of the store was jeans and probably denim jackets. I never bought jeans there. I never wore jeans in those days. I wasn't allowed to wear them to school, and I wore old, sturdy pants. <laughs> Sally. <laughs> I never had enough money for albums. I used to daydream about winning a shopping spree at a record store, and I'd list and relist in my head the albums I'd get. This would have been the absolute height of good fortune to me. One Sunday, the paper listed Lou Reed's Coney Island Baby on sale. I bought it for the cover. Lou Reed in one of those tuxedo t-shirts that were popular at the time. <laughs> holding a boulder. I thought that was very cool. It probably reminded me of Cabaret, and so I associated it with a certain strain of gender-bending decadence, which was correct. But I was disappointed that the music was so mild. My ear wasn't yet tuned to that level, level of subtlety. It was tuned to David Bowie and Alice Cooper. I was sharp enough to hear through Kiss, though. I bought their first record because of the cover, the makeup, but wasn't fooled by the music, which was generic and not at all what I was looking for, which was, of course, theatrical necrophilia faggotry. <laughs> <laughs> War Child appealed to me because of, its, because of its classical, historical, and bardic pretensions. The richness of its arrangements and sense of sweeping old English circus gesture. I bought into Ian Anderson's Elizabethan bum act, or Fagin act, or whatever it was. I dug his leotards and knee-high boots and codpiece, frock coats and frizzy mane, and probably would have disastrously shown up that way for homeroom if my mother hadn't been around to stop me. During my sixth grade fascination with Sly Stone, she blocked my plan after I called three tailors to acquire a skin-tight black leather and silver lame jumpsuit. <laughs> Plus, skating away on the thin ice of a new day really sounded like skating away. Bungle in the Jungle was a hit on the radio then. Hearing it reminds me of being taken out for my birthday to a sit-down restaurant that served ribs with my buddy Alex, and then to see a show, either Liza Minnelli or Marcel Marceau. <laughs> One sounds as improbable as the other. But I asked and was taken to see both. <laughs> Alex and I were flabbergasted that a mime of Marceau's renown was doing the old mime chestnuts of riding an invisible carousel, climbing an invisible ladder, and trying to escape from a shrinking box. It's one of my earliest memories of seeing through, the, through hype. Oh, well, I guess a mime's a mime. Liza Minnelli, I'm not sure how I got mixed up with this. I'd seen her television special, Liza with a Z, and was bowled over by the force of her talent. Then I saw a picture of her in the studio singing background vocals for Alice Cooper, my true archangel at the time which secured my respect for her. The artists you follow lead, lead, you, lead you to others. The cheesier the music, the cheesier its intersections. So with Alice Cooper, I got Liza Minnelli and also Salvador Dali. 
who'd done a hologram of Alice in a tiara, looking like a soused old beauty queen, <laughs> holding a small Venus de Milo. It was a couple of steps up, artistically, to David Bowie, and from him I got Jean Genet. I read that Jean Genie was a euphemism for Genet, and picked up the maids, and, less fortunately, an interest in mimes. <laughs> <laughs> mimes were popping up everywhere in those days. This, there was also the sensational Alex Hardy band. Little, remem little remembered now, but at peak popularity then. Alex Harvey wore a striped shirt, that was his thing. <laughs> his persona was that of a Scotsman who'd been press ganged into naval service. Why there was a mime on board, I don't know, but there he was. Sal Clemenson, mime guitar player. What a mess. Mimes, flutes, top hats, bagpipes, a rattle of military drums, and off we march across the battlefield of adolescence. <laughs>